You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast by Dr. T. Michael W. Halcom, Dr. Frederick J. Long, Dr. Mario Melendez, Dr. Jennifer Noonan, and J. M. Smith. Welcome and enjoy. Shalom. This is Dr. Jennifer Noonan, and welcome to your SLA Insight for this week. Um, so this, we've been talking about the last few weeks, language proficiency, what it means to be good at a language, what the components are. And we've talked about how it's, there are three elements that make up language proficiency. Implicit language knowledge, which is a very significant component. Uh, the language knowledge that you sometimes don't know that you know, that's unconscious and it's there uh, like kind of like muscle memory. And then there's explicit language knowledge, which is the knowledge you do know that you know. You can articulate the rules. You can talk about it. And then also automaticity, which is not just, as we talked about, not just fast processing, but processing that you almost can't stop and takes very little of your mental capacity to do it. So with those three elements, you can be good at a language. So now we're starting to shift into, well, how do you get there? How And for each of those three elements of language proficiency, there's going to be a different teaching approach that best promotes each of those. Today, we're going to focus on implicit language knowledge and how do you promote this knowledge that's unconscious and that learners aren't even aware that they possess it. And so how do you do that? How do you teach someone to learn something that they don't know that they know? Well, SLA has research has shown that meaning focused instruction is the best way to do that. In other words, when you use the language to give and receive messages and messages with meaning, then the brain is able to acquire implicitly grammatical structures and vocabulary items. Now, in future episodes, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at the details and the finer points of what meaning-focused instruction could look like in the classroom, um, research that supports various approaches to incorporating meaning-focused instruction and so on. But for today, for this episode, I want to give you the big picture. Um, and there are two elements, two components of meaning-focused instruction that have to be there in order for it to be a, a meaning-focused instruction. Those two things are input and interaction. So let's break each of those down just a little bit. When we talk about language input, we're talking about either something that you receive um, auditory or in writing. So we're looking at the skills of listening and reading as terms of language input. And if you stop to think about it, really, you can't learn a language if you haven't encounter the language. You have to have input. It's essential. Um, but not just any input is going to, to do. We're talking comprehensible input. And again, in future episodes, we'll, we'll talk more about this. But comprehensible input is the input that a learner can understand, um, not beyond their ability, but not too easy either, because you've got to have something new to be able to learn. This um, the input hypothesis was popularized by Creation in the 1980s, uh, and a lot of research has been done since then to confirm and affirm its validity and, and the need of it for learning languages. It's now an established pillar in the field of second language acquisition. So comprehensible input is language input that is only one degree more difficult than what the learner has already currently acquired. This I plus one is the, the uh, formula that they use for the input hypothesis for comprehensible input. If I is what you already know, I plus one is the comprehensible input that's going to be most effective at helping you learn and getting you to the next level. Again, more on this in future episodes. But um, suffice it to say, input is an essential ingredient of meaning-based language teaching. The second element of meaning-based instruction is interaction. Um, and I want to bring in a quote from the handbook of SLA that just came out with Glossa, came out from Glossa House last year. It says, uh, language is by nature a social endeavor. 
one must be interacting with another person to communicate in a language, even if the interaction is mediated through writing. As learners communicate, interact, and receive feedback, they move forward in the process of language acquisition. Therefore, meaning-focused instruction incorporates interaction as an essential classroom component. So it's not enough to just be receiving input. You need to be interacting in the language with that input in order to fully develop your implicit language knowledge. Now, with this interaction, there are at least three processes at work, and this is why it promotes the acquisition of implicit language knowledge. First, it's a social activity. Language is by nature social. And if you're interacting in the language, you're doing it socially, you're doing it the way God intended it to happen. And so you're more likely to acquire the language because within social interaction, there are all kinds of benefits and so on. And we'll, we'll talk more later about the importance of the social nature of language. But just to, to be aware, this the social activity of interaction is one of the reasons why it works. A second process that's at work in interaction is the, this idea of an information gap. If you have two people talking, one person knows something that the other person does not know, then there's this information gap, and the person who does not know it is invested in that interaction to be able to acquire the information the other person has. So both interlocutors have a vested interest in getting that meaning across because the one person doesn't know it. So if we're talking, for example, like audio lingual method tends to use these pre-made conversations that are memorized dialogues based on kind of stimulus response. If I say, hello, you say, how are you? But that's not information gap. If it's a memorized dialogue, neither, or sorry, both parties in the conversation already know what's going to be said. And they don't have a real vested interest in paying attention to the meaning of the utterance to be able to decode it and understand it. And it's in that process of focused attention on what's being said to draw meaning out that promotes the acquisition of implicit knowledge. And then the third process at work in interaction, we've talked about social activity, just the fact that it's a social endeavor. Second, that there's an information gap. But third, and this is very important for interaction, is the idea of the negotiation of meaning. When you're talking with someone, and again, we're not talking a memorized dialogue, but when you're in genuine conversation, and it's important that that meaning gets across, if there's a communication breakdown, somebody doesn't understand what was said, somebody said something that was inaccurate, then both parties have to work together to negotiate meaning. In other words, to overcome that breakdown of communication. And that also, that investment in the interaction is part of what promotes implicit language learning. The salience of the new unknown form, if it's used by one or needs to be corrected by the other, they're motivated to acquire it, to either understand it or to communicate it uh, correctly. And so this negotiation of meaning, according to Meryl Swain, is coming to a communicative consensus. And it's a necessary first step for grammatical acquisition. So negotiating meaning is also going to promote the implicit learning of language information. So how do we acquire implicit language knowledge? How do we learn what we don't know that we know? By using it in a meaning-focused context, by meaning-focused instruction that uses input, that is comprehensible input, and interaction, and that is genuine interaction where neither party knows fully what the other party is going to say. And the payoff is an increase in implicit language knowledge. And as we'll see in a couple of weeks, it also promotes automaticity. And we're not just talking increased speed, we're talking accuracy in reading and interpreting ancient texts. Now, one of the things that people, especially students, they get a little nervous when you start using implicit instruction. I've had students where I've used a meaning-focused approach in the language classroom, and they're, they're kind of suspicious. They're like, but I, I don't think I'm learning anything. 
what you know we're not using period we're not memorizing paradigms we're not how how is it that we're learning anything and what they don't understand is that they're looking for explicit language knowledge and no they're not learning the explicit language knowledge they're not memorizing paradigms they're not um, expressing the grammar rules explicitly but implicitly they are developing their internal language system is developing and they don't realize how much they do know and so teachers and students alike get a little uncomfortable when you start right off with meaning focused instruction when they're just using the language and they're not learning the paradigms and they're not learning the or they think they're not learning the grammar they really are they just don't know that they know it and so i would encourage you if you're diving into meaning focused instruction i would encourage you to be patient to get through that initial discomfort until you find that later on you're going to surprise yourself. You do know what you know. Your students will know more than they think they know. So that's it for today, focusing on meaning-focused instruction and how important it is for the acquisition of implicit language knowledge, which is essential for language proficiency. Next week, we're going to focus on explicit language knowledge, which is another a component of language proficiency. How do you gain explicit language knowledge? What are some of the approaches that can promote the learning of that part of your language proficiency? So it's been great to be with you today. This has been your language uh, SLA insight for the week. Uh, have a great week. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glossa House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glossahouse.com today. Glossa House, language resources for the global community.